Okay, um, so hi everybody. I'm Claire Riggs. I'm a PhD student working with Allison, um, and I'm also working with Fra Munchi on this project. So to just give a brief um, overview of, uh, or a brief background of what I'm working on. So why do I care about the stellar age distribution of stars and dwarf galaxies? Um, so when we look at Milky Way galaxies, um, we see that their age distribution has older stars in the center and younger stars as you move radially outward. Um, and we know how this is formed. Uh, we know that Mil the Milky Way forms its age gradient uh, via inside out. I don't have much time to go into that. Uh, but dwarf galaxies um, have the opposite trend. So they have younger stars in the center, and as you move radially outward, you see older stars. Um, and we don't know why this is the case. And so that's sort of the crux of my research. Um, is, the, is there a single process causing this age gradient for dwarf galaxies? Is it multiple processes, et cetera? And so I'm... This, this slide, uh, I'll just briefly go over it. So the sample I used to study this question are the uh, Marvel and Near Mint DCJL. Um, there's 81 resolved galaxies I'm looking at. Um, and then this plot basically just shows how I calculated the age gradient. Um, so in this, uh, I split up each galaxy into radial bins, uh, calculated the T90 value in each bin, and then subtracted inside from outside to get the age gradient. And so here are the initial findings. Um, so the age gradient is on the y-axis, um, and basically a, neg oh, a negative gradient uh, implies older stars are on the outskirts, and then a flat gradient means that the stars are uh, about, like older stars and young stars uh, are about the same throughout. And you see this U-shaped trend uh, with T90. And so to sort of investigate this trend further, we looked at dark matter core slope, which if you recall Akasha's talk, uh, she talked about the dark matter profile and that's where we get this dark matter core slope. Um, and so basically uh, all these young, uh, uh, or all the low mass galaxies, they tend to be flat, they have a low mass, there's no gradient and there's also no core. But as you begin forming these cores, you actually begin to see steeper and steeper age gradients. And this implies that the processes that form the dark matter core also reshuffle the stars. Um, however, um, the formation of the core doesn't necessarily mean that the age gradient will be steep. For example, if you look at this trend here, uh, now it's colored by T90 instead of stellar mass, but you see that it inhabits a wide range of age gradients. And so more recent star formation implies a flatter uh, age gradient. Um, and so uh, basically we think that uh, uh, star formation or the continued star formation basically inhibits the gradient formation. Uh, and it looks like I'm out of time. Uh, here are my conclusions and thank you all for listening. Next up we have Juan Guerra. Uh, okay. Hi, everyone. Today, I'm going to be talking about the work that I've been doing on the spherical genes modeling of simulated dwarf galaxies. So very quickly, this is what a typical dwarf galaxy looks like when I think of one. And what I concern myself with is taking observables like the position and velocities and metallicities of stars in these systems and doing some sort of dynamical mass modeling in order to say something about the amount and distribution of dark matter in these systems. And the way that I actually go about doing this is by making a lot of assumptions. <laughs> Specifically with spherical genes modeling, I make several assumptions that I don't really have time to go into, but if all of these assumptions are true, then I can write down this very simple one-dimensional equation, which relates my observables, the spatial and velocity distribution of the stars in the system to the underlying uh, gravitational potential, which is made up of all of these things. Um, and, but in order to do this, uh, I've had to make a lot of assumptions, like I said, which are all to varying extents wrong or lies that I tell myself in order to make my life easier. <laughs> and so that's why I wanted to look at the dwarf galaxies in the mint DC Justice League simulation. So these dwarf galaxies, as they've been orbiting around their main halo, have interacted with other dwarf galaxies as well as their main halo. 
And looking at them, I know that they're not spherical and I know that they're not in equilibrium. And so the spherical genes equation really shouldn't hold. But when I test it, it seems like it does work really well. So here, I've all I've done is calculated every single spatial uh, stellar term and solved for the potential term. And so I've done no real analysis. All I've done is plugged it into this formula. And it seems to actually follow the true uh, potential term uh, pretty well. And in some galaxies better more than others. And certainly in some regions more than others. But it seems to work, All right? Especially if I compare the results to uh, what I would get from a mock galaxy where sort of by design, the system does obey all of the assumptions that I've made, but it still works really well. So genes modeling, specifically spherical genes modeling does work and we might not have to do something too complicated in order to determine properties of these systems. Um, and I said metallicity, so I'll talk very quickly about metallicities. And what we do is we identify multiple population, multiple metallicity populations, like in the middle and right diagram here. And they have different uh, spatial distributions and different velocity distributions, and we can exploit that. And so if I do the same thing for the simulation uh, galaxies, I see exactly what we see in the observations, and I can use that information to calculate masses at different radii. As you can see from this plot, it works really well too. I mean, I'm out of time, so I'll just leave there. Okay, Leo is up next. Okay, uh, hi everybody. I was an undergraduate with Charlotte Christensen working in a research group to study dwarf satellites of Milky Way mass hosts. And so we'll just start off by addressing the problem we have here, which has kind of come up a little bit throughout these talks. And it is that when we typically see dwarfs in the field, and these are in the mass range of about 10 to the five to 10 to the, uh, uh, 10 to the five to 10 to the 10 uh, solar masses, um, these, these dwarfs are typically star forming. And when we then look at them in uh, the local group satellites like Milky Way, or Milky Way and uh, M31, we actually find that a lot of these are quenched. And that begs the question, why is this happening? What's stripping um, gas and or preventing recreation or creation of star forming gases in these satellite contexts? And so it'll come up a bit, um, we have a few likely suspects. So one, we could have a ram pressure stripping, which is pretty widely accepted, and tidal stripping. And the third is which, what we are looking at is stellar feedback. So this could involve the ejection of gas and the heating of cold interior gas, which would, one, delay star formation and could also um, result in direct stripping. And so our goal here is to try to see whether or not supernova heating has a functional um, influence in, in the stripping of gas and therefore quenching of dwarf satellites. So a few pre preliminary results we've been looking at um, have come from the study of 18 DC Justice League satellites we've sampled, satisfying con uh, constraints where they have a minimum mass of 20 million solar masses. And we have specified that they quench by redshift zero, and they fall within two virial radii of their host galaxies. And so what we're looking at here is uh, after a gas particle has been discharged from a satellite, we make uh, we start timing them to see how long they take to return to the disk of their origin satellite. And in particular, we make a distinction between red and blue lines here, which represent supernova heating heated gas and unheated gas, respectively. And what we find is that as time goes on to four giga years, the supernova heated gas is more likely to remain outside of its satellite's disk, suggesting that supernova heating may, may uh, influence uh, uh, gas uh, discharge. And some other things we looked at, but not much time to talk about them, is uh, the difference between just discharged gas and permanently discharged gas. 
and the locations to which this discharged gas um, is removed to. And we, we tried to look at different aspects of this gas in terms of where, where the gas was discharged to, the velocities at time of removal, temperatures, and satellite host distances, but ultimately found that none of these really provided any explanatory value in understanding why supernova heating may influence uh, satellite quenching. So future work will look at uh, controlling for local uh, gas and star densities and controlling for other stripping mechanisms like ram pressure and tidal stripping. Um, and then also incorporating star formation histories to pinpoint uh, supernova activity as a proxy um, to explain, explain trends in supernova heating that we see um, throughout different aspects. So thank you. Our next speaker is Hoge, is that right? Yeah. Thanks. Hi, my name is Oge Okoronkwo, and I just completed my undergraduate degree at the University of Oklahoma, and I'm here at the CCA working with Dr. Brooks and Dr. Farah Munshi. And my project is about understanding isolated LMC mass analogs and their satellites. So my overall like research question is what drives the population of dwarfs of, uh, in the halo of our Milky Way galaxy? And so some questions that I was looking, um, asking myself is where did the LMC come from? Did it have any satellites? How many satellites? Um, what are they like? Um, and how big were the satellites? And then I was able to narrow down my goal to being to identify isolated LMC mass galaxies and analyzing their interactions over time using the Romulus 25 simulation. And here on the left-hand side is an example of an isolated LMC analog using the Romulus simulation. And um, it basically can give you outputs of um, isolated LMC analogs with anywhere from zero satellites to five satellites. So this one here enclosed in the white circle is the host. And then there are five satellites um, surrounding it in the red circles. And then on the right-hand side of um, the slide is some star formation history um, over the course of the age of the universe within um, all of the satellites that were taken from our sample. And then next, similar to LEO, um, now I'm looking at measuring disruption and interaction within LMC satellites. And by doing this, we've been looking at the tidal index. And so this is potential disruption caused by any neighboring galaxies, uh, basically from like the host or nearby um, satellites from differential gravitational pull. Um, and we use tidal index to quantify this. And on the left-hand side is a potentially disrupted satellite um, found from imaging. And you can tell it's disrupted based on the elongation um, of the edges of the gal or the satellite. And then on the right-hand side is um, the tidal index over the course of the age of the universe. And a higher tidal index means that there's more disruption being caused. And you can see that the tidal index does um, significantly increase over the course of time. And so then my future work is going to be studying the dominant quenching mechanisms for these LMC satellites, whether that's tidal stripping, ram pressure stripping, strangulation, um, and we're going to be studying those uh, as a function of definition and mass of the LMC analog. And we're going to be using zoom in simulations, um, which have higher resolutions, um, so we can get the internal dynamics of the fainter satellites like Ultramax. And that's all I have. Thank you. Are there any questions for the flash talk speakers? Else? Oh, yeah, sure, Tom, go ahead. Sure. Use the chair. Um. <laughs> you think I'd learn. Um, how hard was it to find Milky Way, uh, sorry, LMC like satellites around Milky Way like galaxies in the Romulus? Were there a lot of them or fewer than you expected? Actually, there were a lot more than I expected. And you can um, basically tell the code to find a specific analog based on whatever you make your lower and upper bounds. Um, 
Luckily, I have um, a lot of help. <laughs> a collaborator, Jordan Van Nest, actually was one that um, was the original creator of the code. And so um, made it pretty easy for me to be able to find whatever size analog I needed to find. But yeah, there can be a lot depending on what you decide to make your bounds. Okay, thanks. Just to say that she looked at isolated LMCs, so not satellites. As far as I know, I could only find one that was an LMC falling into, but Michael might know better. Which I think is in line with what sort of other groups are finding. It's yeah. quite hard to find yeah. LMCs. So I think we have way. one in Romulus, but we have, depending on definition of LMC mass, a lot of isolated LMCs. Are there any other questions for any of the other speakers? I have a I'm question. I'm going to say that the Zoom people are really not asking any questions. Well, <laughs> I'm going to call you out. I, I, I have a question. Well, actually, a repass. Well, that was. Uh, okay, so I guess we'll move on to the next um, session to keep it. Oh, sorry, I didn't Wait, even see uh, that. Yeah. Uh, Chair. <laughs> um, are we going to get a chance to ask a question off Zoom? Yeah. I turned off my mic. Yeah, sure, Arif, you can go ahead. So I, I have a question. I think it was for Leo, right? The, just the previous talk. Uh, so I, I'm curious. You looked at um, the ex the time over which gas that had been heated by supernovas got uh, removed, and how how long they stayed out. In that Murakami paper that you referenced, one of the main effects that we had focused on was that supernova heated gas was actually much easier to remove. And so the efficiency of stripping, ram pressure stripping, is much higher in systems where you have significant uh, star formation going on. Did you take a look at that? Yeah. Um... That's actually something that is forthcoming that we're going to be looking at, which is to differentiate, to, to see if we can uh, c control for different stripping mechanisms um, and kind of kind of uh, separate those out. So uh, like one of the things we'd be looking at is uh, selecting, surveying more, more satellites that um, have different star formation rates and just as well like different masses and some that don't quench. Um, and so that would kind of be um, getting into that question, but yeah, that's a really good point. All right. Yeah. So I think we, we, we were finding that it was acting more in concert rather than as individual processes acting in, you know, independent of each other. Uh, and, uh, one of my collaborators in, in that group, uh, Hollis Atkins also, also confirmed that. Um, so, okay. Thanks. We'll just, We'll just go on to the next session. So let's thank our speakers again. OK, so um, I am Nicola Aurora. I am a PhD student at Queen's University, working with Stefan Corso and partly with Andrea Macho at NYUAD. Um, and the work that I'm going to present here today is some Nihao local group simulations that Ariana sort of hinted on um, uh, the full thing, along with the tools collaboration. I'm guessing. Okay, good, it works. Um, but first of all, well, yeah, thank you to the organizers, especially Allison, for having me here. Um, all right, let's move. Uh, let's do a quick summary of what the local group is. Um, I think we've heard a lot about Milky Way and Andromeda today. Um, so we have two, sorry, two big spiral galaxies. Um, count M33 as well, because we don't want to leave it alone. Three spiral galaxies and about 100 uh, dwarf galaxies. Now, the local group is actually a very important um, area, corner of the universe, because it allows us to test quite a few galaxy formation and evolution theories, partly because it's very, pro it's close to us, and it has a lot of dwarfs, which are some of the most abundant structures in the universe. And so people have done that. Observationally, um, a lot of things have been discovered for, for, from the local group. So first we have, oh, sorry. First, we have um, on the left, you can see um, a plot that shows just basically the amount of hydrogen divided by stars as a function of how far dwarfs are from the Milky Way. And you see two kinds of populations emerge. Um, one of them, the ones that which, which actually live within 
inside the viral radius of the Milky Way are gas devoid, and the ones that live outside the Milky Way seem to have a lot more gas. Um, and then we also have star formation hi histories that have been studied within um, the local group, and you find two populations once again. Some galaxies, which are called fast dwarfs, which actually live in denser environments, tend to form a lot of stars early on and then just die out. And slow dwarfs, which actually seem to live in fairly isolated environments, um, seem to continue to form stars all their, um, for, for all their history. Um, but one thing that I should mention over here, we're talking about satellite galaxies over here. Um, but it turns out there's also central dwarfs in the local group. Um, so the question that I am actually asking is, if we pick central dwarfs in the local group, can that actually help us understand the general dwarf population in the universe. Um, and so for that, we, I turned myself to the Nihao local group. Um, it is um, essentially just a con constrained local group simulation that has been run with Nihao hydrodynamics. So the constrained ICs from clues give us Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies that are zoomed in over here, along with about 100 or so um, Dwarf, central dwarf galaxies. Um, there's two, two versions of it. One of them is run with fully gasoline, um, exactly the same as Nihao, which is shown over here in red stars. But there's also one shown in gold points over here, which is run without metal diffusion. And so the idea over here is to ask ourselves the question, if I compare these red stars over here um, with these blue and purple dots, um, do I find differences or do I find similarities? Is the local group a unique place in the universe, or is it just like any other corner of, of the universe? All right, so let's get started. Oh, yeah, there's something over here. Sorry, I cannot figure this out. OK, uh, there's something over here. Ask me about this later. Um, I don't have time. So let's start. Um, so the first thing about the local group is the gas properties. of peaks. So what I'm showing over here is stellar mass on the x-axis and gas mass on the y-axis. The left panel shows you all of the gas within a dwarf halo, and the right panel shows you just the cold gas within the central parts. So what we see is when we look at the total gas distribution, Nihao LG dwarfs actually are very similar to the field systems. However, when we move on to just the cold gas, we find an excess of cold gas in the smallest of the dwarf galaxies. Now, there could be two reasons. These small dwarfs actually came by the Milky Way, picked up some gas, and walked away. Or they actually went through supernova feedback, and some galactic fountain-esque effect, effect happened, um, and they have some excess cold gas. You pick your favorite. I'll tell you what I find towards the end of the talk. Um, another thing that is very unique is still related to the gas properties um, is the gas metallicity. So same plot as last time, except on the y-axis now, I have gas metallicity. Um, once again, total gas on the left, cold gas on the right. Um, this time, the cold gas in the central part seemed to follow just about the same distribution as the field galaxies. However, there's an excess of metals in the hot gas halo sitting at the low mass end um, outside the central part. Um, this is evidence of some sort of environmental interaction, whether it is the Milky Way or some other magical galaxy that we actually don't know about in the local group. Once again, I will tell you in a minute. But let's talk about some similar properties. So the local group turns out to be a little boring, uh, or similar, rather, compared to the field um, in all of the stellar properties that I could think of to try. So over here, I'm actually showing you, let's try this, uh, stellar metallicity as a function of stellar mass. So once again, red is Nihao, um, and the points are your local group dwarf galaxies. And I've zoomed in on this middle panel on just the dwarfs. And you can see there's. Not a lot of difference. There's maybe some argument that, oh, maybe local group dwarf galaxies have a little metal poor stellar population, but I do run some statistical tests towards the end, which I'll show you, um, which don't necessarily say uh, they do. Um, on the right hand panel, I have the time it takes to accumulate 50% of your stellar mass. And once again, local group seems to just fall on the Nihao field. I also tested other things like stellar velocity dispersion, star formation rate, average stellar age. They all come out to be just about the same. Um, all right, so let's actually make this quantitative. Um, basically, what I've done on this table, there's a lot of numbers, don't worry about the exact numbers, is construct scaling relations from Nihao and actually then use the local group galaxies to find out on average how far away are my local group is my local group population from the field population. Um, so in just 
Keep in mind, if I am about the same value as the scatter for the average difference, I am actually a significantly different population because my whole average is moved across about the same value as the scatter. And as you can see, as I pointed out qualitatively in the plots before, there's two quantities that actually are different. Um, and both of them are the gas mass, the coal gas mass, and the gas metallicity. Um, so these are the two unique properties of the local blue dwarf galaxy, yeah, central dwarfs. Um, I wanted to see whether we could isolate where exactly this happens as a function of time. So we're still going to use those same scaling relations, but try to look at this average distance as a function of time. So the top left panel over here just shows you a typical scaling relation that I would build. Using that scaling relation, I'd calculate what the average distance delta D is between field and local group, field being red, uh, field being red. Um, and then basically just do it for multiple time steps. So what I have is time, uh, this is hard, time as a function of delta D. And I can figure out how different um, local group population is from dwarfs, uh, from field. So here is the gas mass, stellar mass plane as a function of time. Um, the colors remain the same. What I'm showing on the top is the total gas. On the bottom is the coal gas um, as a function of time, redshift on top. And as you can see in the top panel, the total gas content as a function of time remains exactly the same as the field galaxies. However, around redshift, let's say two, one and a half, things start to sort of diverge away in the local group cold gas. Um, and this sort of corresponds with um, the peaks of um, the star formation history in the universe and also within the local group as well. So we want to know what is it? Is it the environment causing this difference? Or is it actually um, in situ local group dwarf galaxies sort of processing metals themselves? So that's what I'm showing over here. Um, on the x-axis, I have just the oh, on the x-axis, I have the amount of metals that actually fall into the galaxy. So this would be the contribution from the environment. And on the y-axis, I have how much metals these dwarfs actually make on by themselves in situ. Um, the contours actually show you present day mean gas metallicity. Um, and the size of the color points shows you what the stellar mass of the galaxy is at redshift zero. Now, this is a very complicated plot, or it's a very complicated way to actually present what I showed you earlier on with stellar mass gas metallicity plots. But this actually lets us sort of differentiate between in situ and environmental processes. So there's two populations. So what, what I can tell you about the red points, if you focus on that for a minute, is that the red points over here follow the mass metallicity relation. The bigger galaxies, given some scatter, of course, um, are at the top at higher metallicity. And they just sort of follow along this line with smaller galaxies coming over here. That is not the case with the local group. There's two populations that pop up in the lo local group. The first one is right over here, um, which actually falls right on top of the Nihau field dwarfs. And what these galaxies, uh, studying these galaxies actually individually made me find out that these galaxies are actually exchanging gas within amongst each other um, at fairly late times. And what that allows it to do is have significant or orders of magnitude, actually, if you compare it with these three small galaxies, um, order of magnitude more metals come from outside. But this metal accretion that happens within the local group happens at fairly late times, about eight giga years or so. Um, then there's a second population that pops up over here. Um, I have not tested that because, as you can see, these three galaxies don't have any environmental metals coming. They're barely nothing. But they still make just about the same amount of in situ metals in their gas. Um, and I think why this is happening is because of tidal torque. Um, basically, you have something come, something come close by, be it a small guy or a big Milky Way guy, and that sort of allows for um, sort of condensation of, or sorry, compaction of gas that can form stars. Now, I can say I have not tested this. This is sort of in the near future. Uh, but that's sort of my theory why this is happening. One interesting thing is that we track how much gas actually is going out from Milky Way and Andromeda hosts into these dwarfs. And the answer is nothing. All of these dwarfs are actually, because they're living in a dense environment, provided by the gas, uh, sorry, the gravitational potential of the Milky Way, actually are able to share dwarf, uh, gas within themselves without actually having any help from the Milky Way. So I'll conclude over here because um, the clock's being passive aggressive at me. Um, 
So I started by asking you this question, is the, milk, is the local group unique? And I feel like just like any other question in science, the answer is yes and no. Um, yes, we find a unique dwarf uh, gas, gas content in the local group dwarfs, but no, because the stellar, pop, stellar content is just about the same. And I think the reason why the stellar content is just about the same is because the gas that is high metallicity has just not had the time to cool down onto the central parts of the galaxy and actually form stars and sort of show that enhancement of excess metals in stars. But also one thing that is fairly interesting is the Milky Way Andromeda uh, system not significantly contributes to the metal en enhancement of these local groups. And thank you, exactly at zero. So. <laughs> So there's a question on Zoom, actually. Um, you can go ahead, Jordan. Yeah, um, thank you for the great talk. Um, I have a question that might have been addressed in one of your early slides when you were talking about uh, T50 and the other properties in uh, local group versus just the regular eval. Um, and you said pretty much all of them were the same, like there wasn't much difference between the local group and field eval. is that correct? Yeah. And does that include like explicitly like quenched fraction of dwarves in those environments? Did you look at that? Yes, I actually did look at quenched fractions as well. Uh, and I did not find any difference. It is so weird to talk to someone on a computer, but not here. And I can't see them. Anyways, yeah, I did check quench fractions as well. And I couldn't find any. OK, interesting. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so we don't have enough time for any more questions, but if you have any questions, I'm sure you can email Nikhil. Email me, chase me down, yeah. pick so, your favorite. Yeah. So let's thank him again. Thank you. Great. Uh, well, hello. My name is Jordan. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Oklahoma, uh, working with uh, Farah. Um, and before I get started, I just want to give one final thanks to all the, the staff and volunteers and organizers of this event. I think the conference seems to have gone exceedingly well. Um, and a special shout out to Allison for giving me the honorable and not at all high pressure closing talk slot, uh, which I will be using to talk about satellite distributions around Milky Way analogs in Romulus 25. Maybe, yes. So uh, it's been a long two days. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of ease this in with some background. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar, the Milky Way is what we astronomers consider a galaxy. And it is actually the galaxy that we live in. And as such, uh, it is the most well-studied galaxy in the universe. Uh, and we depend, it, we depend on it a lot uh, to determine some sort of physical models for galaxy formation and evolution. And Anna Wright gave a great example of this yesterday in her talk on uh, stellar halos, something we can really only observe kind of locally. Um, but for all we know and all we study about the Milky Way, there is still a lot we don't know. Uh, and a great example of this uh, can be found in the Milky Way's satellite population, uh, where recently as our detection and abilities and instruments have improved, we found a lot more low surface brightness satellites that previously we just didn't know existed. Um, and if we want to use the Milky Way and other close by galaxies like Andromeda to kind of intuit things about more similar galaxies elsewhere in the universe, uh, the question of the Milky Way's uniqueness becomes a very important one. Uh, are Milky Way and Andromeda standard galaxies for this mass range, or are we maybe generalizing based on some outliers? And so surveys like the satellites around galactic analogs and the exploration of local volume satellites seek to determine, kind of answer this question of the Milky Way's uniqueness by studying the Milky Way's and other similarly massed galaxies, satellite populations. But regardless of the answer to uniqueness, there's kind of a parallel or maybe even more foundational question. And that is what is driving this satellite formation and accumulation in galaxies like the Milky Way, right? What processes are making uh, the Milky Way unique or not? Um, and that's the question that we sought to answer by studying satellites around Milky Ways in Romulus 25. So uh, we find ourselves here once again, face to face with the obligatory Romulus slide. Um, and so just as a quick recap, Romulus 25 is a 25 megaparsec per side volume in body cosmological simulation. And it's actually an amazing tool for this analysis because it provides such a large volume 
a uh, large number of galaxies while also maintaining the resolution to probe satellites down into the dwarf regime. And so if our goal is to study uh, satellites around Milky Ways, we need to first find all of our Milky Ways in Romulus 25. And so almost immediately at the start of this project, we run into a complication in that there is no kind of standardized criteria for defining a Milky Way in the literature. Now, if you're at the NBSC conference last year, that phrase might sound kind of familiar, and that's because I said the exact same thing about ultra diffuse galaxies. So clearly I have some kind of habit about being nitpicky on definitions. Um, and so to see if these definitions were kind of influencing our results in any way, we identified Milky Way analogs over multiple criteria sets. Um, and this is where the code that Oge was talking about earlier comes into play. Um, I was able to select Milky Ways on uh, kind of three different physical criteria and kind of tweak the ranges as we saw fit. Um, and the first one was just a general cut over virial mass. So anything with a log in beer between 11 and a half and 12 and a half. Uh, the second cut was similar, only over stellar mass. So anything between 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11. And then uh, the third kind of property criteria was a K-band magnitude cut on anything between negative 24.6 and negative 23. Uh, but the K-band cut also had some additional environmental uh, restrictions put upon it. And uh, those K-band values and environmental restrictions actually come straight from the Saga 2 paper. So this is kind of our um, mock Saga observations for our simulation. And in addition to alternate Milky Way criteria, we also used alternate ways of identifying satellites. So as simulators, we have the privilege of looking at a Milky Way analog and getting a definitive answer for what the viewing radius is of that halo. And we can say satellites are anything centered in that radius. Um, observers aren't so lucky. Um, so to mimic what Saga does, we also did a run where we identified satellites as anything within a uh, flat 300 kiloparsecs of the host. Uh, which is kind of the value that Saga uses as their proxy for virial radius on all of their um, identified host halos. Uh, and so when we set out doing this, we thought we had a pretty good idea of what this would look like. It seemed that our definitions were getting increasingly restrictive as we kind of go down this list on the table. Uh, and we were picturing our samples in a kind of hierarchical manner where we'd have a very large virial mass sample and inside of that would be a stellar mass sample. And inside of that is the K-band and environment, the Saga 2 cut. Uh, but if you look at column three here, I don't know if my cursor is visible, but column number three, which is showing the number of Milky Way analogs in each criteria set, we see that that is not at all the case. In fact, our virial mass sample is actually the smallest, while the stellar mass sample is the largest. Um, this is a li little easier to see when we look at our samples graphically. Uh, so here I am showing um, those three key samples again, so the burial mass, stellar mass, and Saga 2 cuts uh, in log mass versus K-band magnitude space with burial mass in the top plot and stellar mass on the bottom. And to reiterate, we are seeing that our samples are not simple subsets of one another. Rather, there's lots of overlap in kind of these intermediate uh, phase spaces. But as the definitions approach the criteria for each property, which are the, the gray dotted lines, the samples start to diverge. Um, so in red, for example, here, we have galaxies that have sufficient stellar mass to meet the stellar mass cut, but insufficient virial mass to meet the virial mass cut and vice versa. Um, and so to make sure selecting on one property versus another wouldn't affect our results, we just performed our analysis on all the definitions and kind of looked at the properties of everything. Um, and so as a quick kind of quality test for our Milky Way samples, we first looked at the luminosity functions of all the satellites and we compared them uh, to some observations. Um, and you're seeing two examples here on the left is the virial mass sample and on the right is the stellar mass. And you see that uh, the range of luminosity functions spread by our Romulus um, halos in gray uh, match pretty well with observations. And in fact, to note the Milky Way in orange, you kind of sits very nicely in the middle of our distribution, so very well explained. Um, we do note some of the definitions, though, have trouble kind of recreating the really satellite rich um, systems like M81 or Centaurus A. Um, so we have kind of a general overview 
our luminosity function satellite distributions and Milky Way seems to be a good match. Um, so we progress now to look at just kind of general properties in terms of the number of satellites and how that distributes across our whole sample of Milky Way analogs. Um, so here I have all our analogs binned by stellar mass along the x-axis and environment on the y-axis, where our measure of environment here is taken to be the distance to the closest halo whose virial mass is greater than 5 times 10 to the 11. And then the color in each bin uh, just represents the average number of satellites hosted by the analogs in that bin. And the text there, which may or may not be legible, is just giving uh, statistical information. So the number of analogs in the bin and the standard deviation of the satellite count. Um, and so if you look at this plot and use your human pattern findy brain, it seems that there is a pretty decent trend from this top left corner down to the bottom right, where INSAT is increasing with host stellar mass and environmental density. Um, but we note that we are missing kind of a critical juncture in our phase space here. Without data in this upper right corner, it can be kind of hard to verify that uh, trend with environment, right? It, anything could really make sense, while the trend along the x-axis seems pretty clear, uh, but still could just be humans seeing what we want to see. Um, so we look to validate these trends in a more quantitative manner. And to that end, we turn to um, something called the specific frequency. Um, and so this method was put forward by Harris and Vandenberg in 1981, and they used it to study the number of globular clusters hosted um, by galaxies of vastly different sizes. And what they wanted to do was kind of remove size from consideration and just see how in their whole population the count of globular clusters scaled with the galaxy luminosity. Uh, and that sounds remarkably like what we're trying to do here. So we just modified the equation to see how the number of satellites trended with host mass and with host environment. Um, and so here you were seeing that plot for um, specific frequency of inset uh, scaled to mass. And we see that there is a very strong and well-defined trend where as mass increases, specific frequency of uh, number of satellites also increases in tandem. Um, and if we look at environment, however, there is no clear trend. Uh, you could even argue that there is clearly a lack of trend. Um, the specific frequency values are almost universally zero, with the exception of these really strong and odd outliers around seven megaparsecs. Uh, and so what this is showing us here is that Host mass seems to be a very strong driving factor in satellite accumulation, while environment seems to be playing little to no effect. Um, and in terms of mass, at least, this is in agreement with what Saga has found in their, their Saga 2 paper. They said that they did seem to find a general trend where uh, the number of hosted satellites was increasing with the host K band brightness, which is a proxy for stellar, stellar mass. Um, so, so far we've seen things where the Milky Way and the local group are in good agreement, at least in terms of the number of satellites hosted. Um, one thing that seems to be in disagreement though is the quenched fraction. Um, and so we looked at that as well. Uh, and again, we utilize specific frequency. Um, so here we're looking at the specific frequency of the quenched fraction, that is what percentage of a host satellites are no longer star forming. Uh, how to see how does that trend with host mass? And again, we're seeing a very strong trend with host mass, where more massive things tend to have a higher quenched fraction. Uh, and this is uh, in seems to be at least in good agreement with the ELF survey. Um, in their paper, they have this plot, which is quenched fraction versus versus uh, K-band magnitude again as a proxy for stellar mass. So more to the right, higher mass. They found that their population's quench fraction did increase with um, host mass. I will note, though, that our satellite mass range is not one to one. They're considering satellites in this paper down to a log stellar mass of 6.75, um, where we stop at uh, 10 to the 8. And that's just because we think Romulus is likely over quenching satellites below that regime. So we just kind of play it safe and don't consider those in the quenched uh, quench fraction analysis. Um, in terms of environment, 
preliminary results are suggesting that there is a trend with environment and quench fraction where things um, in something like the local group, so pairs are more quenched than more isolated systems. Um, Saga and elves also seem to find this uh, on this plot and the purple and yellow are Milky Way and Andromeda and you see that their quench fraction is higher than kind of the at large distribution. Um, but I will say our results are a little complex and confusing and I'm hesitant to say anything definitive yet. I can talk about this more during the questions if people are interested. Uh, but for now, I think I'm right on my time, so I will go into conclusions. Um, so just as a quick summary, we studied the satellite populations of Milky Way analogs and Bromus 25, and we found that independent of analog definition. So one thing I'm realizing I forgot to say was that while all the um, these specific Hoogsley plots and these box plots um, were for the burial mass definition, but regardless of definition, they all look uh, remarkably similar. So these kind of macroscopic trends that we're finding are independent of definition. Um, so independent of definition, we found that the number of satellites hosted by Milky Way analog generally increases with host mass, but environment seems to have no effect on that number. Um, in addition, the quenched fraction also seems to increase with host mass. Um, so I want to give final thanks to my collaborators, uh, Farah, Charlotte, Allison, Michael, and Tom. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Are there any questions? Okay, because we're behind, I'm just going to say we can move on to the, the next session. So thank you, Jordan, for that talk. And if we can thank all the speakers again, that'd be great. <laughs>